In pro basketball last night, some history was made at the Dunn Sports Center in Elizabeth. The New Jersey Gems made their debut before a crowd of more than 1,900 fans. The Gems, who play in the brand new Women's Professional Basketball League, are seen here on offense against the visiting Chicago Hustle. The lead changed hands 20 times before the Chicago Hustle finally came out on top. 123 to 120. Here's a good move by a Chicago player. The league features plenty of offense, as you can tell by the final score. Among those in attendance, Trish DeGasparis. At first, you really wouldn't have known that a page of sports history was being written here Sunday night. There was no unusual fanfare, no wild ovations as the players were introduced. The general attitude of the fans seemed skeptical, reserved, a wait-and-see-what-kind-of-a-game-these-women-can-play attitude. But to everyone's delight, the women proved that they play fast-paced, exciting basketball as they treated the 1,900 fans to a teeth-grinding, edge-of-the-chair game. I'm really raving over and I hope they do well tonight. Do you like it as much as men's basketball? I think it's more interesting. The women got to stick together. I think it's much interesting, right? Don't you? But there's always one dissenting opinion in the crowd. I think it's just a higher level of uh, college basketball, that's all. The lead changed hands 20 times during the game, and there were 13 ties. Gems coach Don Kennedy was appropriately worried. High scorer for the Gems was Montclair State's wicked Wanda Sarametta with 24 points. But the Gems lost anyway as Chicago squeaked by in the last 34 seconds of the game to win it 123-120. This first game couldn't have been more exciting. I'll bet you're happy about that at least. Oh, very happy. I thought we played a good game. We came, we had it in the lead for a while and then we lost it and we had the lead again and lost it and then we were down by so much and came back. So at least we can prove we can come back. What did you think of the fans? I was really pleased, even if there was only a, you know, 1,900, it seemed like there was 50,000 people in there to me. They screamed and cheered so loud. Even though the Gems didn't win their first game, they got their feet wet in professional basketball. But this first game means more than a win or a loss. It'll set the pace and tempo of women's basketball in New Jersey. And if the rest of the games are anything like this one, the Gems should have no problem at all. And Elizabeth, this is Trish DeGaspris reporting. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available. A curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey now, how's it going everybody? Your pal Tim here. Fun times ahead for you here on your favorite podcast. Of course, it's Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for finding us. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to the proceedings. And um, we're going to try to alter our format a little bit this week, uh, and we're going to try to uh, essentially provide to you uh, what I think is a wonderful conversation in the form of a roundtable around a very fascinating and interesting and, and intriguing topic, and that is the earliest days, the pioneering days of women's professional basketball here in the United States. I think uh, you youngins out there may think the WNBA was sort of the beginning and end all of women's pro hoops in this country, but oh no, you would be absolutely incorrect. Um, uh, not uh, not to be blamed, uh, however, of course, because in this uh, this era of internet and uh, uh, instant gratification and information at your fingertips and stuff, it's very 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 easy to sort of forget uh, the various sort of uh, nooks and crannies of history. And we're going to shine a spotlight on one of them, probably the one uh, that is probably uh, by all accounts uh, circled on everybody's. Um, history book pages and notes, uh, as to kind of the beginnings, the true foundational beginnings of the pro game for women here in the United States. That's, of course, the Women's Professional Basketball League, otherwise known as the WBL, from, uh, let's see, three seasons it lasted, from 78 until 1981. And uh, the clip that uh, set up the proceedings uh, kind of gives you a bit of a, of a hint of sort of uh, what was uh, sort of at stake and involved. Our pal Steve Holroyd uh, apparently sent uh, that clip up to uh, the YouTube cloud, and we appreciate him doing that uh, for our own selfish purposes. That was from the New Jersey Network. If you remember that, it was a public television station collective in the state of New Jersey that uh, acted as a network for a number of years. Great news and sports and that kind of coverage. Uh, the um, uh, that was from their nightly newscast on uh, December 18th, 1978, recapping, courtesy of uh, reporter Trish DeGasparis, the uh, day before his game from the 17th of the New Jersey Gems playing their first ever game against the Chicago Hustle, probably one of the most successful teams 
if not on the court, certainly in the minds of fans in the Chicago area. They were on WGN TV, actually, with their own game coverage, if you can believe that. Um, back in the day, the women's professional basketball league, the WBL. Uh, the Gems, of course, losing a very close battle with the hustle in their first game, but the impression was made. And they lasted for three seasons, which is about as long as the entire league. Um, but we are uh, uh, just uh, ecstatic to welcome four, count them, uh, lovely ladies or wonderful women. They're probably both, but whatever alliteration you're, uh, you're uh, aligned to. Um, we are uh, honored to have them. They are all part of a, uh, a, a wonderful organization called Legends of the Ball, which is devoted to and dedicated to uh, writing uh, the wrongs of misbegotten or, for, or truly uh, completely forgotten history when it comes to the women's game. And it's not just the women's professional basketball league, but it's certainly sort of a center uh, for it. it. It goes back to things like Title IX and, and various um, uh, pioneering efforts of the, the collegiate game in the 70s. And, and, and frankly, the diaspora that came after the WBL, like um, – uh, a bunch of different sort of leagues that sort of came and went. Um, but, you know, uh, in the late 90s, when the ABL, the American Basketball League, popped up, that was uh, a shot across the bow of the NBA, and they got their WNBA thing going at that time. And they essentially, with uh, bigger and deeper resources and pockets of of the owners of the NBA, you know, wound up sort of, I guess, winning that sort of battle uh, to what is now a 25-year-plus uh, success story, uh, and then some in the WNBA. Um, but make no mistake, most historians and frankly, most people uh, in, involved in the game, like our four guests this week, certainly will will tell you that the WBL was uh, a foundational component of that and a catalyst in many respects. It it was the transition point from a pretty strong and budding uh, amateur and collegiate and Olympic sort of sport for women into the possibilities, albeit for only three years, but the cast was set, right, um, for professionalism uh, that, you know, arguably um, would have made what exists today a lot harder and maybe would not even have led to what exists today without the existence of the Women's Professional Basketball League, the WBL, which we're going to get into with our, our uh, guests this week, Liz Galloway McQuitter, who is the president of Legends of the Ball. Um, and I want to make sure I get their um, the teams that they played for, the WBL, correct, I believe. Let's see. So Liz was uh, a, a part of the Chicago Hustle. She was nicknamed the Bandit by uh, 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 the recently departed but much loved radio and sports broadcaster Les Grobstein here in Chicago. Um, and again, the D WGN here in Chicago was covering games. Uh, they were a big deal. They're on the radio and stuff too. So they were uh, well covered. And, and Liz's name may be some uh, a name that you may remember, frankly, you Chicago sports fans. Uh, Charlene McWhorter Jackson, um, who played for the Washington Metros, the Milwaukee Does, the uh, aforementioned Chicago Hustle, and the uh, the St. Louis Streak. So there's some names from the past. Um, we are also joined in our conversation with uh, uh, our new pal, Adrian Mitchell Newell, who was uh, part of the hustle and the streak as well, played her uh, collegiate ball at Kansas. And a name you all may remember from one of our earliest episodes, almost uh, maybe three and a half years ago, Machine Gun Molly Kazmer. Actually, it's Molly Bolin. You may remember her as that was her maiden name back in the, in the day, but Molly Bolin Kazmer is back. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation with her. And um, as you all remember, she was part of the Iowa Cornets uh, and uh, also the San Francisco Pioneers after a quick dalliance with a, uh, uh, for one year at least, uh, challenger league to the WBL known as the LPBA, the Ladies Professional Basketball Association. So all four of those ladies, Liz and Charlene and Adrian and Molly are here for a, a, an absolutely uh, just fascinating and, and, and lovely conversation. Uh, so much that was learned by yours truly and um, and so much more to unearth. Um, and we are excited to present it to you. Coming up in a few moments' time, our, let's call it, Women's Pro Hoops Roundtable. Uh, as we remember fondly, 
the WBL and uh, all the things that came before and after it uh, coming up in just a few moments time. We'll have all kinds of uh, uh, websites and, and, and places to follow all of it as well as part of that conversation. But stay tuned. You will enjoy it uh, to the max, I, I assure you. How about a sponsor that uh, makes a ton of sense uh, in relation to this week's proceedings, shall we? Uh, let's uh, spin the dial to uh, our friend Kevin Schultz in uh, Florence, Kentucky, and uh, the website that uh, is a, a, a great visit and a wonderful trove and uh, an opportunity for lots of great T-shirt and, um, I don't know, hoodie uh, and or mug and or um, all kinds of things related, uh, memories at reboundvintagehoops.com, reboundvintagehoops, all one word, dot com. And there, as the name implies, it's excellent and hard to find logos on great merchandise, lots of it clothing, some some actually other, other things than clothing, uh, such as mugs, for all kinds of great basketball teams of the past from all kinds of leagues, including wait for it, the Women's Professional Basketball League, the WBL. Yes, this is the place, reboundvintagehoops.com, to get your merch for the great teams of yore, such as the California Dreams, the, the Chicago Hustle. Do you remember the St. Uh, St. Louis Streak? How about the New York Stars? How about the New Jersey Gems, of course? The Minnesota Phillies, the Iowa Cornets, the Houston Angels, the Dayton Rockettes, on and on and on it goes. You will find all of those logos. You will find all of those items for you there. And again, if you want it in a a, a hooded sweatshirt form, you want it sort of in a collegiate classic sweatshirt form, you want it in a long sleeve t-shirt form, you want a short sleeve t-shirt. Do you want a, a mug to drink out of? Any of those things and more can be found. At uh, I can't even remember the name now. It's I'm so excited. It's reboundvintagehoops.com. You'll get all of those teams and more. And it's not just uh, the Women's Basketball League, but it's also all kinds of leagues. The Eastern Professional Basketball Association, uh, the Continental Basketball Association, the ABA memories, et cetera. They're all there for you there, again, at reboundvintagehoops.com. And, of course, a promo code for you is Good Seats. And you use that promo code, Good Seats, you're going to get 10% off all of your purchases. Once again, at reboundvintagehoops.com. Where else are you going to find great WBL memories and stuff and merch uh, than there? And we thank Kevin and uh, his friends down in Florence. I think it's Metropolitan Cincinnati, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for his patronage uh, and support of the show. We appreciate it. Uh, We appreciate you checking him out, hopefully uh, giving us a few shekels of referral love. And... Of course, let's get into the conversation that will get you ready for making those purchases, shall we? Here's our conversation uh, with the lovely ladies from the Legends of the Ball organization as we talk about pro hoops back in the 70s and early 80s. Here's our chat with Liz, Charlene, Adrian, and Molly. Please, as always, enjoy. Can you feel the excitement in the air? Yeah. yeah. Well, we love to talk, so any chances. <laughs> well, all right. Well, that's cool. Well, so uh, let me just start by saying thank you, everybody, again for for being for being part of this conversation because this is actually kind of a um, kind of a thrill, and it's also really awesome uh, to know that there is um, an organization that is uh, devoted to uh, not only remembering but uh, sort of underlining uh, the contributions. Uh, of the pro women's game, um, you know, when we're really sitting at the precipice now of, of an explosion of pro hoops for women uh, after, you know, many, many years of fits and starts. And, and, and um, it's just exciting to talk to all of you and, and one of you uh, again. Um, but Liz uh, Galloway McQuitter, why don't you, uh, you're kind of the chief cook and bottle washer of all of this stuff. So why don't you Give us a little bit of background about Legends of the Ball, who you are, why it was formed, and 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 what the heck you, you're doing with all this, because it sounds really cool. Okay. Um, thank you, Tim. In, um, 2000, in 2003, we had a reunion, uh, uh, a WBL reunion, brought together by Kara Porter, who wrote Mad Seasons, which is really kind of like the only, uh, I guess, official book 
that's out there on the league. Um, even and, though and it's sorry, great- have we have we tried to get her on the show uh, for the last four years? Yes. Have we gotten any response? <laughs> no. So perhaps a little <laughs> guilting and shaming device there. Just go ahead. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I as good a book as it as it is, and and um, anecdotal and um, informative and all those good things, and we and we like that it it brought us to attention. I think the the stories told from the players themselves is the best history. Uh, the people who were there, the, the women and the men of the WBL. But we we're, we're very grateful to Kara for bringing us together and for all the great work and the great collection of memorabilia. She did a, an amazing job of pulling together so much memorabilia, interviews and intellectual property from the league. So we're very grateful to her. But we, we certainly wanna have the opportunity to tell our own story through our own voices. So after that reunion uh, in 2003, we all came back together and then we all kind of went our separate ways. But what, what never went away, even before the reunion, after the league folded and after the reunion was this dull ache that every time something was mentioned, we were omitted. So history can be omissive, history can be incomplete, history can be just plain wrong. So I would say that was the first ping, as you said, as far as not not forming Legends of the Ball, it wasn't Legends of the Ball then, but it was this desire to tell our story. Okay, so uh, being around sports after the league and coaching, I was constantly reminded that nobody knew about the WBL. And let me just stop and say, we're more than the WBL. We're more than the three years we played. Um, So we're also Title IX Trailblazers, AIAW Trailblazers, as well as Trailblazers of the WBL. So after that, you know, time goes on. And uh, thanks to Doug Bruno in large part and the members of the board of the Hall of Fame and Annie Myers, who's also one of us and also on our advisory board, Ann Myers Drysdale, um, we got uh, we were uh, selected as Trailblazers of the game in 2018 and inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, we had the largest group they have ever had of trailblazers. We came together and, it, and the same feeling, the same emotions rose again 20, 25 years later. And then 2018, people still don't, 15 years later, didn't know who we were and our contributions. So leaving, upon leaving there, and, even, and while we were there and being inducted, it just felt like it wasn't enough. It felt like a ceremonial Induction. This is no offense to the Hall of Fame. We have great partnerships, uh, a great partnership with the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. But I think what we've done is educated them as well as others about just how broad a reach we have and had as a league and after. So upon leaving um, and just talking, um, I thought of starting a nonprofit. And so and it was to, pro- our mission is to promote the historic and social relevance of the WBL to inspire future generations. You know, I'll just leave it short there, but that's, that's what we've been doing. So who, who do you go to? You go to the people you know, the people you trust, the people you built that bond with from the WBL. And you'll see that, that our board makes up those people. Everybody was hand-selected. I don't want, I, I'll let them tell how they came, but I'm just... Um, that's that's how Legends of the Ball began. So we knew that we had a mission to get our story out because of all this history and all this relevance that preceded, during, and after our, our contributions to the game. So it's a ripple effect that is still resonating in the coaching field, uh, obviously, is a big, big area that we made great contributions, but we had all different kinds of professions, uh, empowering young women and uh, changing the landscape socially, politically, as well as athletically. And the more you dig, the more you look into it, the more you're gonna find out about the women of the WBL. And uh, you know, I'll save something for somebody else to talk about, but you, you're also talking about Olympians the eight of the first Olympians were from, uh, from the WBL. And uh, so the story continues. We're, we're three and a half years going strong, not quite three and a half, uh, over three years in existence. We've grown, our reach has expanded, and, but yet our job is so far from being completed. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and look, I, I think um, uh, you've sort of teed it up really well. I mean, the WBL is is almost it's not sort of the sole focus of this, but it's almost like a portal, right? To yes. everything that came before. Why the WBL came into existence in the late seventies, which we'll get to. Um, as well as what has come thereafter. And definitely listener, listeners to this show know, uh, and Molly may remember from our conversation a few years back, um, it, it, we're always intrigued as to not only where this history winds up living, but frankly, uh, remembrances of such, because on the backs or on the shoulders of uh, the pioneers, if you will, and to, to, to you know, uh, that's, that's a, a label that aptly applies here for sure. You know, the mm-hmm. WNBA has been around for 25 plus years and and for the WBL and, you know, the the or, uh, origins of it and the diaspora from it and the things that occurred in between uh, those two leagues, uh, it's important to understand those things, right? So. Mm-hmm. And that was in a nutshell. There's so many different layers. There's so many different parts. I mean, we'd have to talk for a long time to cover all those things, but I think the more you... Uh, follow us and look to what we're trying to put out and what we're trying to do. That's why we, that's why we need our own documentary. That's why we're working on that now to get it funded because the story is too big, too broad, too important um, not to have our own documentary. I agree and look forward to that. Ladies, uh, jump in. Uh, no uh, particular path. Uh, 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 please identify yourselves for our audience and um, let's uh, hear your the initial parts of your stories too, please. Uh, This is Charlene McCorda Jackson, and um, Liz and I uh, have been friends ever since I started playing for the Chicago Hustle in uh, the first in the WBL. And we just kind of, and and as well as Adrian, we just kind of connected uh, and we've been friends and and have maintained that friendship uh, all of these years. So when Liz came up with the idea, and of course, I was there at the at the reunion as well. And when Liz came forth uh, about the idea of starting this nonprofit and she uh, talked to me about it, I immediately said, oh, of course, I would love to be a part of it because I too uh, had been feeling that people just don't know. And if this gives us an opportunity to get the message out, but also to do a lot of other things to benefit young people, I was all for it. And especially after having coached for uh, 30 years uh, high school and then during summer basketball camps all these years uh, it just I just felt like the time uh, was now uh, to be able to bridge the knowledge of what the kids young people uh, do not know and what the what those young people really need to know so when she came up with the idea to start Legends of the Ball and she uh, approached me about being a part of it I most definitely was on board with it yeah, and, Char and it, was the first person I called after there were three of us that were sitting at a table and Char was the first person I called followed by Adrian. Yeah. And, and Charlene, I'll, I'll ask this and I'm sure the, the other two will probably have their own little anecdote too. But um, mm-hmm. how, in that your post playing days coaching career, how many knew, how many do know, how many have asked about your professional playing career or, or is it rarely come up? Actually, it's a little ironic. Uh, that you you asked that question because uh, back in October, uh, some of my first players that I coached in high school uh, decided that they would give me an appreciation um, surprise event. I don't want to say party, but a surprise event. event. It was more like a banquet. Uh, and the reason why they wanted to give me that was because they felt that I had been a major part of their lives over the, after 30 years, they came to the realization that uh, we are who we are because of what coach Jackson instilled in us as her players. And so um, when they started talking, learning about my playing career, a, a lot of them said, coach, you never talked much about yourself. You never told us a lot of that stuff we did not know. Well, you know, I been, haven't been around young people. They feel like you're boasting about your past accomplishments and they really turn a deaf ear to what you have to say. So that, and I had just come back from playing. Uh, I started coaching there after having played in, in Italy for a year. And I came back to Albany, Georgia and started coaching uh, at Westover High School here locally. And so um, 
you know, I just had the, the mindset that these young people, they, it's all about them, it's not about me. So I really didn't give them a lot of information. So when at that event that they had for me, uh, I was totally um, shocked at how many former players came back, how many former players wanted to come and couldn't come, but were instrumental in making sure that that event took place. It was amazing. And they were talking about, coach, we didn't know this and we didn't know that. And so uh, I, that, there again, it gave me an opportunity to inform them about, about my, my professional career as a player. And that's when Charlene started wearing her Chicago Hustle uniform to practices, right? <laughs> Adrian, Molly, how about I, some of you? I wish I could still fit. I yeah. Tim, I wish I could still fit it. <laughs> Adrian, Molly, how about you guys? Uh, this, is, this is Adrian. Um, I didn't really have much choice in joining Legends of the Ball because- uh -oh. Here we go. <laughs> Liz called me up and said, I'm starting this nonprofit. You know, people don't know who we are. We're the foundation of women's basketball. Uh, they don't know who the pioneers are. Our history needs to be told and da, 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 da. And Charlene's mm -hmm. going to be with me. And you're going to be the You're going to be the treasurer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're going to be the secretary. I'm like, huh? I'll be the secretary, yeah. <laughs> So just like that, I was part of Legends of the Ball, Inc. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's been a phenomenal ride. These three years, we've accomplished so much. And I'm really proud uh, to be a, be a part of it and happy that Liz thought of me and uh, kind of finagled me into being secretary. <laughs> So, so the three, the three of you, and we'll get to Molly in a second. But the three of you uh, all share that connection with the um, vaunted Chicago hustle, uh, right? Uh, Adrian, you were part of that mix for uh, perhaps yes. even more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was second round, uh, second pick in the second in the second in the year. first round mm -hmm. in the first round. Yeah, so I played the second season of of uh, the the you know WBL for the Chicago Hustle. I was drafted. Well, you know, what's interesting is that, um, Tim, is that the, these reunions um, did bring us all together and all of a sudden, you know, you become, you're no longer the competitive. I mean, we, we were still competitive, but I mean, you're, you're all, we bonded, you know, as, as players that had shared that experience of trying to launch women's pro basketball and going through that, that trailblazing experience together. So, you know, even the fact that when um, the Chicago Hustle, and there's six of them on this board, <laughs> And I'm from the Iowa Cornets and DK Thomas is on the board and she was one of my Cornet teammates. So um, I had I had a homie had my back here when I joined this board. But uh, Liz Galloway, the quitter, uh, known as the bandit in the league, was one of the, the, the strongest defensive players uh, that I ever played against. And when she slammed me to the ground a few times, I didn't forget about <laughs> it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's so funny because we've come full circle. I love her to death. Um, I consider her. I mean, I admire her of what she started with this Legends of the Ball. She recognized, she knows her history. She's the hub of the wheel of women's basketball. And I, I don't care which direction you go in. She knows people and she, she understands it. And she can reach out and share that history like nobody else has. So you've actually got the four officers, um, you know, on this uh, interview with you today. And so, you know, we do work together. We have extra meetings on top of that. And, and but, you know, Liz is the... Liz is the, the slave driver here. She makes things happen and we just hustle to try to keep up with her. But it, it's been an amazing experience because people do uh, need to know their history because everybody thinks that women's pro basketball started with the WNBA and there's, there's big gaps. And we were just, it really does hurt to be left out of history. And Liz has done an amazing job of, of pushing our agenda with, with Legends of the Ball to correct and, and maintain our place in history. Well, it's also good to know that now we know finally the the actual reason for the founding of the Legends of the Ball, right? Because it sounds like now it is it is is clearly a grudge uh, leveler organization for all those uh, <laughs> pushes and fouls and and all that on the court back then, huh? But you know, what? let me say this, Tim. Uh, what we found, and 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 I won't deny that there's a lot of pain involved and a little bit of angst and. Uh, 
uh, maybe a little bit of grudge, but the most important thing that we have discovered, and I think each person will speak to this, is you don't know what you don't know. And so they, they just don't know. And when we do tell them, the Adrian and Sharon and I just came back from a ladies ball tournament in, at the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame with these youngsters who totally embraced us and treated us like celebrities and treated us like WNBA players. I mean, and their parents and their coaches. Um, our follow, followers have gone up 200 <laughs> since we left that uh, thing. So I think what we have realized is once they know there is an appreciation for it. So that's the big battle. And that's where we need your help. Every other medium or outlet that we can, anybody that will listen, we need the help. We're trying to do so many collaborations with the WNBA, with Wilson, with the NBA, with the Smithsonian, with the Naismith. We already partner well with the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame because what is what we found is once they know they celebrate with us. They acknowledge and honor what we did for the game. So oh, that's yeah. the battle is getting it out. Yeah, for for sure. Uh, so let me let me talk about sort of the WBL just in particular. So I'm really curious to each of your stories. This is free form from here on out, frankly. Um, so let's uh, dial the Wayback Machine to what? The, the summer or fall of 1978 when this thing was getting off the ground. Um, how did you guys come into this league? How did you find out about it? What was promised to you about it? And uh, what about the trepidations about this quote unquote professional league for women, which had really never been done before? I want to speak to, I'll tell you this, Karen Logan, who designed the smaller bike, we'll talk about her a little bit more in depth at some point in this program, um, came to UNLV, which is where I was, Deborah Wadi Rosso, uh, Janie Fincher, Belinda Candler, um, Janice Fuller, uh, Rhonda Pinquite. We had about eight players from that uh, school, but just on the team, Deborah and I had just uh, graduated and we were still, we were in grad school. Janie Fincher Rowland, though, though older than us, she had been at several different schools and had, uh, was playing there. Belinda Candler was a senior. So she came to UNLV to actually tell us. So Deborah Wadi Rosso and I signed, uh, well, we went as free agents. Uh, the others were drafted and uh, we ended up playing on the same team, Deborah, Janie and I that year and Belinda went to Houston. But um, that's how I got into the league. And was there a hesitation? Absolutely not. Um, there was on my mother's part because I was going to Chicago. So that was just worry. But the thing is, we had just fallen in love with basketball. We had just received scholarships to do what? Play basketball in college. So we just received those and boom, my senior year was a heartbreaker. We didn't get to pretend. I just believe we would have, we might've been national champions other than Delta State because we had beat them and Immaculata in a tournament earlier that year. So uh, it came to an end because of uh, regional, some fees not sent and our coach, I mean, we didn't get to participate in the regionals. So there's this, this, saying goodbye to a sport you've just fallen in love with. And now you tell me I can rekindle that love affair. So yes, we were going. And I think that's the pioneering spirit. I think that's what needs to be acknowledged from, and as you listen to each one of uh, our stories and all the stories of the women of the WBL, we actually have a project we're working on now, my title nine story, which speaks to that. We, we all had just fallen in love with this sport and now we have a chance to continue it. That's what a pioneer does. They go into the unknown and they don't hesitate. There may be some fear of it or some worry about it, but they take that leap of faith. And that's what, that's what I did. And that's what all of us did. I think we all, you know, just being in love with the game was, was amazing for myself. I had two years of college eligibility left. So I hadn't really had time to think about the next steps or playing pro or anything like that. But the general manager of the Cornets was, had been my former college coach. And he came to me, you said, what was promised? Well, not only did he make the first official signing of a, of a pro basketball player in the, in the governor's desk in, in the Iowa state Capitol building, because Iowa was the first team to join the league. So they made a big, you know, PR announcement, um, of that, then he promised me a part in a Hollywood movie that summer with Pete Maravich on top of that. So it was like, it was like the best thing that ever happened to me. Like a fairy godmother had come down and granted some 
amazing wish that I didn't even really know I had because, um, you know, I just jumped at the chance like we all did to, to get that opportunity to play. And it was, it was so exciting. We were so uh, full of hope and excitement and we believed that we could uh, make this happen. It was, it was a great time to be a basketball player right then to have that opportunity. But then, Tim, this is Charlene McCord Jackson again. And, and really, in all honesty, in my circle, um, the people that were uh, most instrumental in me going to play in the league were my college teammates, uh, my college coach. Uh, my mom said, whatever you want to do, that's up to you. Uh, but in their mind, and all those people mind, you mean to tell me they got a league where you could go play post high post college and I said I didn't even know anything about it uh the sports information director at the at the uh, college uh co contacted Albany my State. coach at Albany State College contacted my coach and told my coach about it so my coach started putting feeders out there to see what this was really all about and this was of course the second year and so I already had my my goal set I was going to be graduating from a college in four years and I knew what I wanted to do and uh, my goal was to get it while it was free and that back then it was just a four-year scholarship so I, my, my determination was to finish up in four years and go in and get a job I, I had my path set so everybody else in my circle girl you need to take a look at that you need to try uh, you know they never had a women's professional basketball league and you could be one of the first ones to be a part of this so why don't you at least try and that's how I ended up playing in the league. And I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever uh, in jumping out there. Uh, I mean, there were some, a lot of bumps and to answer your question about something being promised, there was nothing promised. I was just <laughs> eager, to, <laughs> eager to play, to continue to play. And uh, that was my, you know, my real reason for going on because I had no clue about how things were gonna be. Yeah, I think being in the um, second season, you know, the first season had already been established and it seemed like it went really well. So um, knowing that, I think a lot of us who came out of uh, college who wanted to continue to play, and I think Charlene did, was to go overseas. So my thoughts were, well, maybe I'll go overseas and play. Uh, but then this you know, this had come about and I'm like, wow, I can, I can stay here in the United States and I can play basketball. And, um, I got drafted and I mean, it, it wasn't second thought, maybe about, Oh, what about my boyfriend? Maybe something like that, you know, who's <laughs> <laughs> now her husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who became but, uh, her husband. <laughs> of course, you know, you know, I got drafted by Chicago hustle and, um, you know, that I mean, it's his history. We were there, the, you know, the longevity of the league, not at the hustle, but I got traded to St. Louis. Uh, but like nothing was, you know, nothing was promised. You're just happy to play. Yeah. You know, you're young, you're happy, happy to play and do the things that you love. If it works out, that's great. If it doesn't, you're still young. And, uh, but we had no, you know, we all knew it was going to work. It was going to last forever. And, and it could have just think if um, the NBA had backed us back then. And I think Molly just found an article about that, right, Molly? If we had been backed back then by the NBA, oh, yeah. then maybe Jim, we would find have been the WNBA. Yeah, find this really interesting. Um, the, after the WBL uh, went through their first season, all eight teams intact, it just exploded. Um, everybody had been watching and waiting in the sidelines to see what was going to happen. In year two, they, the WBL expanded from eight to 14 teams. And then all of a sudden, we've got three NBA coaches uh, in our league that had won NBA championships. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Dean Memminger had won one of the Knicks um, uh, at Milwaukee Doe's. Uh, that, that coach. Who Larry Costello. Larry, Larry Costello. Costello. Um, you know, and, and then... Uh, uh, Larry O'Brien, Butch Van Bredekoff was at New Orleans, and Larry O'Brien, uh, the, the, at the, the time was the commissioner of the NBA, was at our draft the second year talking to Bill Burns, so they were keeping a close eye on us there to see if we were going to make it, but that second season came in with such a bang because we had, we had skimmed through that first season and done so well that, um, you know, they just really thought it was going to take off, and we just really, I think, overextend, they overextended the solid franchises in that second season, uh, which started the struggle. 
Well, well let's let's get. We it. always say what if, Tim. We always say what if, and mm-hmm. you mentioned Larry O'Brien. What if the NBA had gotten behind us then? You know, what if? Yeah, look, this is you know, as listeners to this show certainly know, the '70s in particular, right, where it was a heady time for uh, uh, experimentation and innovation and entrepreneurialism in pro sports. I mean, it was an explosion of leagues, not all of them uh, long-term successful, certainly, but, you know, in football and in hockey, for Mm -hmm. sure, with the WHA, the North American Soccer League was booming at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, so, uh, and people like Bill Byrne and, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, Gary Davidson and and, uh, uh, all these, you know, now historically sort of pioneer types, right? Uh, So many different sports and opportunities and stuff. But that said, Right. I, you know, you, you all, a bunch of you have mentioned your parents and, and other people. So this, there's got to be some level of skepticism and frankly, reality check once like it's, it starts going on. Right. Because there's things like travel and you got to pay bills and your relationships. And, you know, how are you, you know, how much are you dependent on the uh, uh, support and or, um, shall we say, financial uh, uh, offerings of others in this process? Because, I'm sure it's not uh, your your wages are not necessarily keeping you fully afloat, or are they at this point? Um, Absolutely, the reality not. check of WBL. Yeah, we worked. Shar and I worked at the park, the Chicago Park District. Yep. We worked. I mean, we worked in the off season. You know, the w, you could say the same thing about the women today. Um, they play and don't get the. I mean, obviously their salaries are a lot better than ours, but maybe comparatively speaking, not. But they they work in the off season. They go overseas. It's where they make the bulk of their their money. So sadly for women, that's what we have to do. But we worked during the during the off season, and um, I didn't feel any type of financial struggle. You know, when I was playing and getting paid, I didn't feel a financial struggle. But yeah, go ahead, y'all. Y'all can speak to whatever y'all did. But we we went to work <laughs> in the off season. I was I was lucky. This is Molly. I was so lucky that I played for really strong ownership teams uh, with the Iowa Cornets, even though they only uh, made it the first two seasons and needed, we needed a new owner and were unable to find one. And then I went on to the San Francisco Pioneers. It had really strong ownership. So I was so fortunate to receive all my salary. And by the third year, I was making about $30,000 for six months work. So I thought that was, I was pretty happy with that. Plus I got paid for doing some extra marketing and promotions on the side, but um, it was, it was just really, um, you know, it's exciting. And we really, what people don't understand about the WBL and this history is we experienced the success of the Women's Pro Basketball League. It wasn't just, even though the press, we needed them so badly to say something positive about us. It was, it was skepticism from the very start. So we didn't get negative. We were so positive, the players, because we had to overcome the negativity of how other people looked at us because there was constant comparisons to the NBA and to the men. And you're stepping into the men's ring here with this women's pro basketball. And, and if you can't slam dunk and you don't play like men, we're not even going to give you respect. So we had to fight through all of that. And that's why Liz says it's the historical and social relevance because we had overcome all those expectations and comparisons in those early days. So the players for the most part were so positive and we wanted to make it work and we're willing to sacrifice and work so hard and, and just try to overcome the negatives that were thrown at us daily, mostly from the media. I'd like, I'd like to speak to the media of Chicago though. We're very fortunate. Uh, Chuck Shriver, who was our general manager and who's still alive today and very involved with us once again, um, used to be with the white Sox at one time he was with the Cubs. And so he knew the pro sports scene in Chicago. He got them to come to one of our practices just because of who he was and the contacts he had, because nobody was coming to cover us. They came and watched us and fell in love with us. And so the media in Chicago, the local news, the all the we had our own uh, sports beat writers for the from the Sun Times and the Tribune, um, the radio stations. Uh, we got great coverage, very positive coverage. I can't say that everybody did. And maybe national writers and the ones that Molly is speaking of, I think those were on a broader scope. But locally in Chicago, the coverage was great. We were treated like the other male pro sports teams. Those male sports teams came to our games and supported us. We had appearances with them. It was was a very positive experience 
in Chicago with the media and support. Now, I'm sure there were some who maybe were skeptical, but if you're talking about the top writers of the time and, and those top two um, newspapers and magazines in town, Ebony, Shar is actually in Ebony and some others. I mean, had a great article in Ebony Magazine. The, and they, um, our coverage was positive. Well, and you guys also, the Hustle also led the league, I think, every year in terms of attendance. And, and do I have this mm -hmm. right? You even had some games broadcast on WGN here locally, the big station? Yes, Chuck, Chuck yeah. Schreiber once again brokered that deal. And um, we he, um, same thing, took it to him. It was his experience dealing with the pro teams and his contacts. And uh, it started off with just a, a few games. We actually outdrew the Blackhawks at the time and, and competed with the Bulls. And I always say pre-Michael, but still competed with the Bulls. Jerry Sloan was at our games. Uh, Walter Payton, the Bears used to come to our games. But yeah, uh, my parents got to see us way back in Texas. You know, Channel 9 did for us. It did for that for DePaul University later on. They became this national team under Coach Meyer because of Channel 9 broadcasting all of, you know, nationwide. But yeah, WGN certainly, uh, not just for the hustle, but for all the other teams. And those are the, we still have videos of those games. All right, what's this? LinkedIn jobs. Hey, these days, it can be hard to find and hire the right candidates for your small business. That's why LinkedIn jobs made it easier to find the people that you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 770 million people. My goodness. Focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience and use screening questions to get your role in front of only the most qualified. Then use the simple tools on LinkedIn Jobs to quickly filter and prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. Yes, that's, it's no surprise, friends, that LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Of course. Well, did you know that every week that nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Come on. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash good seats. That's linkedin.com slash good seats to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to our conversation. Give me some sense of, of um, besides the media, how about the playing conditions and the fans and uh, the uh, facilities and, and uh, travel? How was that? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure it was, I'm, it sounds like a lot of the, um, the realities of that were, uh, you were looking at as much of that as possible through rose colored glasses, but it could not have been easy, frankly, despite some of the media being supportive in some of these markets, I'm sure it was not universal. Charlene well, should speak to that because that's exactly she, what I'm about to do. That is she exactly, played for four teams, and but she yeah. also played with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah actually, I did. And then I'll honest <laughs> him when I, I was drafted to the Washington Metros the second year, of course. And so they their their idea was to treat us and have us as a professional organization. However, the funding that they wanted and that they had hoped to receive did not come through. But their goal was really, and you can see the, the vision that they had was really a good vision. But the finances, they gave us a free uh, apartment where uh, two people stayed in an apartment and it was like, it's really nice housing. We practiced it. Um, at a, a military base and uh, the facility was was condition good was good condition and but then we traveled when we traveled we stayed at like the uh, a Hyatt uh, we played before the uh, Washington Bullets uh, twice we played uh, in the Madison Square Garden before the New York Knicks twice and the league and, and the team folded in December of that year and so uh, from in 1979, uh, it folded in December and I was picked up by Milwaukee in the first round of the dispersed draft 
and uh, I came home for two days and I had to report after two days to, to Milwaukee, which my suitcases got lost. Uh, and then I said, they put me up in a hotel. But even there, Larry Costello, having coached for the, in the NBA, was the coach at the time. So he knew how to run a professional program. They tried, but the finances and the, the financial support just was not there. So I got one check while I played in uh, Washington. It was a $500 check. We didn't have to pay for uh, our uh, apartments. They paid, that was part of the contract. But there were so many times when we went on the road for a game and we were like, oh my goodness, we don't know if they paid the rent. Are we going to come back home, come back and our stuff is going to be outside on the curb? You know, we just <laughs> didn't know. And that's the truth. And so, but they, like I said, they wanted it to be uh, treated up there with, you know, in the top professional ranks, but it just, they just didn't have the financial backing. So after playing in Milwaukee for, uh, I played, what, six, eight games, something like that in Milwaukee before they selected me, the coaching staff selected me to represent Milwaukee in the, uh, and as a uh, rookie in the All-Star game. And um, then after that, uh, it's public knowledge, it's printed that Doug Bruno came in and stole me from Milwaukee because they had not paid me uh, since I had been there. And so I, that's when I came to play for Chicago and that's when I met Liz and uh, and then the, I went from Chicago to Milwaukee because my, the third year of the league, I ended up getting hurt. I, mean, I went, to, I went, yeah, I went from, from Chicago to play, play, play for St. Louis. I got hurt on my third, the third year of the league, which was my second year. I had a severe ankle sprain and they kept trying to get me back and they just kept re-injuring anyway. Uh, so I ended up getting traded and that's when I met Adrian became roommates and we bonded that friendship forever <laughs> from me going to play in Milwaukee. I mean, play, I'm sorry, going for me going to play in St. Louis. So and many things, you can't keep them straight. I can't. Mm -hmm. I went from Washington to Milwaukee, from Milwaukee to Chicago, from Chicago to St. Louis. Yeah, but I, but, the, but the good thing about Chicago, uh, they, were, they uh, made a commitment to me that they would pay me uh, all of the money that I was owed from all of those other teams, they paid me my entire contract. And then my, my second year, which was the third year of the league, uh, they increased my contract by uh, like 58%. So they gave me a big jump in uh, bonus in, in, pay, in the contract. So that was it. <laughs> so but was but our, stories, our, our stories are not uh, like, the, does it represent every team star, if that's what you're thinking of, Tim? Well, I think we just happen to land in some very positive situations. But there, for, for all the stories that we've told that are positive and getting paid, I always I got paid. Uh, I never missed a check and, and all that. I think there are a lot of other WBLers who can tell the opposite. Yeah, I never missed a Even in uh, Chicago or St. Louis, I never... Yeah. Mr. Check, they took very good care of me. Even um, the third year I left St. Louis and went to uh, Southern California Breeze. I think I played with <laughs> Olympics. Yeah, Adrian and I were teammates. <laughs> we were Adrian, teammates. Doesn't remember. Adrian doesn't remember though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about Molly, Molly sent me an article. She said, Adrian, here's an article where you scored 28 points and had 16 rebounds and you don't even remember. <laughs> I was like, Adrian says she just played and that's it. She just I, plays. I just played, I played the game. But um, <laughs> um, I, Southern kind of, they didn't last long. You know, that was another league that uh, tried to start up and a lot of us jumped over, you know. Yes, yeah, simultaneous with the WBL. Yeah, this, was, this was the Ladies Professional Basketball Association. Is that correct? Yeah, that yeah. was them. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. right. and, and, and I think if I, if I remember correctly, Molly, I think you had a dalliance with them before coming back to the WBL. Yeah, Is that right? And, uh, right. Yeah, Adrian and I were both on the Southern California Breeze team and they lasted from like October to December and they didn't get their financing either. So Right. We all jumped back to the WBL um, by the beginning, by January of 1981. So I, I'm really curious, though, uh, the, in many respects, that sounds like um, so that was a challenger to the WBL. I'm, uh, and I'm guessing that meant that there were certain circles out there that said, hey, there's something to this women's pro game. Right. Let's set up another league. But but, I, you know, in retrospect or maybe even at the time, 
Uh, and I could see from a player's perspective, hey, is another competitor, and that helps me, you know, uh, have increased chances and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, better salary and, and contract uh, terms and all that kind of stuff. But to the cynic, right, it also is, you know, uh, yet a second league just after the first one just started. Uh, you know, I'm just curious about that dynamic because it, we, people may not remember the WBL, but they certainly don't remember the LPBA. Right. Can I can I speak to this because in our in our fight to bring the WBL out of the shadows, I it, it means a lot to me, and they know that I will always mention it. I can't do for them what I'm trying to do for the WBL, but there are nine recognized women's pro leagues. That doesn't include those who tried, who never got acknowledged, or people who were talking about it. And in 1975, they never got off the ground. And so that makes us the first viable. The reason we put that word viable in there is because we technically are the first. Technically, we are the first. But there was one that was formed, never played a game. So it's not recognized. I recognize them because they tried. And then we came. And then the LPBA, then WABA. And, and so up through 1996, and then uh, the ABL and the WNBA. So during that 15-year stretch, when the last... Uh, women's professional recognized professional league, you know, attempted to start. I think we have to acknowledge them. And we know some players that played in, in WABA and some of the other leagues after us. And so do you not acknowledge them as women's professional basketball players who came before the WNBA and the ABL as well? Yes, I do. And I think it's not fair to not acknowledge them. So obviously they don't know about us and they don't know about the others either. But I, for every attempt, for everyone that tried and chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, I acknowledge you as well. Well, you know, I played in uh, three different pro leagues, the WBL, uh, the briefly in the LPBA, who thought they could succeed by not traveling coast to coast. They were trying to do a Southwest Regional League. Ah, I get it. Regional. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they saw that there were some, some mistakes being made as far as uh, the amount of money. Uh, the WBL. Uh, went through $12 million, which is in today's money, almost $42 million. And they they tried to duplicate the NBA, but it took the NBA many years to get where they were. So we couldn't start, you know, where the NBA was. So that was the mistake, I think. But it, this league, what people don't understand is that, you know, the it wasn't about people not wanting to watch women's basketball. It wasn't about people not wanting to buy tickets. It was about having owner stability to give us the chance to, to get our footing and, and, and survive. So, and, and what I want people today to understand is that these big gaps in history of, of opportunity um, existed. There was all of us on this call now. We just uh, didn't have opportunities like they do today. And, and I just want people to uh, realize and appreciate that you know, there were big gaps of time when women had the opportunity to play and big gaps of time when we didn't have the opportunity to play. So what did we do? We played against men. I played three on three against men. I played men's leagues. I mean, I played some of the best years of my career in men's leagues because there was no pro league to play in. So then, Tim, after the after the league folded uh, my third year here again, just like when I came out of college, I was committed to going on with my life, you know, uh, post basketball comp, comp, playing basketball competitively so I end up going to graduate school and I said well you know I'm going to just go on and, and get started with a real job you know teaching and coaching then all of a sudden I received a telephone call from Doug Bruno uh, which encouraged me to uh, go over to Italy and take a look at their team and that's a whole nother story in itself, which I won't get into, but it was a, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of sort of like a trick, but I ended up, ended up uh, biting the bait and I went over to Italy and played from uh, 1982 to 1983 uh, after the league folded. And um, so I, I just was still had commit, thought I had committed myself to not playing competitively anymore and going a different route with my life. But, you know, when opportunities to play and you love the game as much as all of us do, uh, when opportunities are presented, you, you jump on it, you know, even not knowing had not knowing what it was going to be like, but it ended up being a very uh, good opportunity. I really uh, enjoyed playing in Italy, but um, I was married and 
uh, wanted to start a family. So I opted not to go back to play anymore after that one year. And yeah, Char- Char- Charlene, you're, you're bringing up, it's, this is a, an interesting theme that we hear, we've heard for years on this show, uh, in, for, in particular for uh, the many challenger leagues that have come in the realm of pro football, right? Still yet now, more of them still coming. USFL this year, XFL is coming back next year. And to a person that we've, you know, to, to the extent we've talked to direct participants in all these things, and it goes back, going back to the things like the World Football League back in the mid-1970s. Um, and I'm sure you're, th- this is, is with all athletes who have a taste of the pro experience. Um, is this sort of, I hate to sort of, you know, be trite about it, but the love of the game, right? It's a, it's kind of like, you know, one last chance. You want to continue to play professionally. It's a dream. It's hard to say no. And frankly, a lot of times you kind of throw logic out the window because it's another chance to play, right? And you'll figure out a way in your mind's eye to figure out how to make it work, even if it means living, you know, and sleeping on a park bench if you have to, because you get to play pro ball again. Right. Right. And we had uh, we had opportunity to do camps, uh, get help, get camps started, when, you know, in Chicago and to do a lot of things to try to um, uh, help kids, too. But um, I still do camps during the summer at 64 plus. <laughs> I'm still doing basketball camps during the summer. But um, so you, you just because you know what it meant for you and the, the, the doors that I know, the doors that, that basketball opened for me. So I want to, uh, even in my, with my high school teams, I wanted to make sure that they knew that there were doors that could be open for them if they, uh, through, through basketball, that they put forth the best effort. And with my, my knowledge and experience, uh, I was trying to expose them to things that they ordinarily would not have been exposed to. Well, I never gave it up, Tim. It's like once I had experience the success that I did with the WBL. I was all of a sudden a pro without a league. And um, I would not commit myself to any other career, any other job except making pro basketball work. And I was committed to getting on another pro basketball league. And that's that's why I was involved with five different attempts uh, prior to the WNBA. But um, yeah, I, I was not able to move on very easily. Well, let's, let's also be, let's also be clear though and we talked about this when you were on our show a couple of years ago i mean you know you were uh, one of the more uh, well known and highly publicized faces of the game and and actually this leads me sort of into another sort of question i i want to sort of get into the fans and this sort of goes back a little bit into the media thing um but let me start with a personal anecdote i actually went to a wbl game i think it must have been Jan- i think it was january of 81 all right i grew up in northern new jersey so i didn't see i don't think any of you play uh, in person, although that would have been ironic and interesting and, and, and fun to reminisce, mm-hmm. but it was, it was the New Jersey gems and the New York stars, right? Uh, the South mountain mm-hmm. arena and beautiful West orange, New Jersey. I think it's called the Cody arena now, but still there. Um, I think Ann Myers had just left, uh, the gems over contractual dispute or whatever, but Carol Blaze Jowski was now on the team and, and the, uh, uh were they the Dan and twins, Faye and Kay young? Yeah. Um, yes, they were also mm-hmm. getting buzzed too. And and why did I go? I you know I don't know. I was a snotty teenager. You know, just I, I'm interested in sports and and there was a lot of local publicity about what was going on with the gems. And this was now their third year. And I think they were sort of doubling down, I guess, on some of the, the high wattage stars, I guess, of the league. And I guess the the the, the Faye, Faye and Kay were on TV with the Dan and commercial and all that stuff. Um, but it was curiosity, right? I. I it, um, and it was interesting. It was fun. It was, you know, it was 2,500 or so, you know, sort of rattling around there in the gym. And it was, but the game, the quality of the play was uh, just overwhelmingly, um, uh, it was a revelation to me. I, I, I don't know what I was not, ex- was or wasn't expecting. Um, but that said, I, you know, I also recognized too that was I the target audience for this? Um, and I guess I'm just curious as to how you guys felt both as players and participants and as um, uh, uh, proselytizers, shall we say, of the game, uh, how do you felt, feel the league was sort of marketing itself and how are you trying to reach out? Because, you know, young girls playing the game and, and, and looking to folks possibly as, as uh, 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 models, role models to become pro players and all that kind of stuff. But you could easily see the sense of the league trying to reach out to the quote-unquote casual sports fan with, no disrespect. I mean, it, 
Molly certainly had a, a, an image uh, that was uh, uh, appealing beyond just the game of, of, of basketball uh, and, and heavily marketed. So the, the Dan and commercials and all that stuff, that's obviously a, a wider range to sort of get quote unquote attention. Um, I guess the, the question in there is, did it pollute and or uh, maybe distract from the game playing and the high quality of, of women's the women's game for the sake of publicity and, you know, bringing in people arguably maybe for the wrong reasons, or was any publicity good publicity? I, I think you know what I'm trying to get at here. I want to speak to that because I want to speak to the, the hustle and that's all I can speak to uh, directly. I think I have a, a knowledge of the other places we played in because I played there and I saw the fan base, our fan base, people talk about the girl dad nowadays. Uh, we had, the girl dad back then, men who brought their daughters. But we also, this is also speaks to the social change. We also had men who brought their sons. Um, so we had little boys coming to the games, little girls coming to the games, dads bringing them. We had the mothers, we had businessmen, we had the other pro sports teams. So the fan base was across the board. Uh, at least in Chicago, it was. If you were to look at a video of our game, you would see men in business suits. You would see African-Americans with their Afros in the stands. You would see little girls, little boys wanting our autographs, just like the little girls did. That's social change and social acceptance. And I think once you tap into that, it transcends um, male, female. And you just look at look at us and look at women as athletes, talented athletes. Now, um, I'm going to say this, and Molly can speak to this too, but Janie Fincher, no doubt, brought people into the game because of how she looked. And I think, Molly, you can say the same thing with Molly of what was perceived as, you know, ultra feminine or beauty or however you want to say it. But the, the thing is, they could both play. I don't think it works if they can't play. Then you come and yeah, you get to watch them or somebody that you perceive as the, the most beautiful player out there or the sexiest, however you want to say it. But the fact that they could literally play the game and play well, uh, I think kept people coming. So I think it would wear off if you just want to come look at somebody. You know, y'all can take it from there. But I our fan base was... Uh, not it was multi-dimensional it was not one-dimensional and i can speak for this having talked to chuck shriver about it who was uh our general manager and did so much of the marketing and the 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 for the fans they went after everybody and we had representation from everybody i just think it was so frustrating um to have a, a good product because the, the players in the wbl just the improvement from year one to two to three was just incredible. It just kept getting better and better. And we were standing on our own with like legit basketball fans, but there were so many areas and places and uh, that they just didn't give you a chance. They weren't even going to go in and, and sit in the gym and watch a game just to see out of curiosity. So yeah, um, we, we did a little uh, shock marketing. I think of, of shaking people out of their um, stereotypes and thinking all women were looking, acting and playing like, and trying to be like men. Um, there was that going on too. Uh, that was a, a negative that we had to overcome in society. But um, the, the people, by the third year, I was just looking, Jim, I was just looking at some uh, attendance records. The third season when Nancy Lieberman played for Dallas and Blaze over there at uh, New Jersey in the playoffs drew over 8,000 people a game. And, and that's, that attendance showed you that that league was catching on, that people saw that it was fun to watch and they were becoming interested in as basketball players. And yes, we did a lot of things just to try to get the people to give us a chance to come in the gym. But I think some of those, those attendance numbers in that last WBL championship showed that this is a league that should have made it and should have you know, gone on and brought Cheryl Miller in in 1984 after the 84 Olympics. And, would have just, you know, if we had just made it up to the 84 Olympic team, um, because that, then all of a sudden USC uh, is getting all this attention with McGee twins and Cheryl Miller, that would have had the pro league waiting for them with open arms. And we just didn't get that chance. And Cynthia Cooper, Cynthia Cooper could have literally played in the WBL and the WNBA. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty cool. 
Mm-hmm. But then, uh, then on another note too, uh, we had, and I'm gonna uh, uh, ask Liz, to, you know, to attest to this. We had quite a few season ticket holders too from the Chicago Hustle. Mm-hmm. We had uh, Liz m- mentioned about the type of, of of people that were in attendance that I gained from every walk of life. But we had people that would drive from uh, north of. Uh, Chicago to be at our games that were, like, I think about Cronodome Liz and, and talking about mm-hmm. that. These are people that lived in the suburbs who would make their way uh, to, and they were regulars, regulars at the Chicago Hustle Games. And then of course we had, we had a good fan base when I played in Milwaukee uh, too. You know, uh, we had the W, I mean, the NBA players supported us because we did play there in the, in the uh, NBA arena. And uh, so we became friends with some of them. And um, I had the privilege in Chicago of doing some uh, radio co- color, uh, you know, for, of the Chicago Bulls games. And so we became friends with some of them. And so the, the, our fan base just kind of increased and increased. We went to Cabrini Green apartments and did outdoor uh, basketball clinics. Uh, we were, uh, I remember being in a magazine. And so there were things that, that the um, some of the owners and general managers were doing to really promote our sport, which actually helped to get people in the stands. And so the WGN games being televised, that's a whole nother spectrum, but that was a huge part of it. But at the same time, we were willing and a part of, of being a part of the team was that you go out and promote the, the team. You, go out and promote the league. So whenever they told me I need to go speak at this Lions Club up in the suburbs of Northwest suburbs of Chicago, I put on my best dress and I was taken there to speak to these, all of these men about, you know, about playing for the Chicago Hustle. I mean, that was a, you did what you needed to do to promote the team and the league. Yeah, yeah and- our you know, opportunity and what we needed to do to get out in the communities, like uh, Charlene said, I don't remember a lot of commercials. I, I know that the Dan and, the, you know, the <laughs> Faye and Kay Young did uh, commercials, but I don't know anyone else. But, you know, Rena did. Uh, they no, were local, but they, they, were, yeah, they local. were local, but they were, yeah, they were local commercials. But yeah, they, they were commercials in Chicago. That's what I think that's what set Chicago apart. Go ahead, Adrian. With yeah, point. yeah. I mean, we had some local things. We had uh, Lazy Boy, you know, was a mm-hmm. big promoter of ours. And uh, but as far as commercials like the WNBA girls have now, you know, we didn't have anything like that. And wouldn't that have been like, what if again, you know, Social if media we had <laughs> that thing like that, you know, but they didn't. I mean, the WNBA girls didn't get it until when, Liz, when, uh, um, the, get what Adrian? Uh, commercials and shoes and yeah. Well, and well, well. Ray Pond, Ray, Ray Pond, Pond yeah. who is one of our advisory board members, and we're p- petitioning to be in the Hall of Fame as a contributor. And this was after the '96 team. You got to understand, women's marketing wasn't. They weren't doing it. Right. And there were no women in those commercials and with the shoes. And so Ray helped through Nike. Nike's commitment and this, the Olympics, Molly mentioned the 84, what if with the 84 Olympics, the 76 Olympics jump started the WBL. The 84 Olympics would have continued the lifespan of the WBL, I think. Well, had I, I'm it sorry, survived. I, I mean, interrupt you. I was going to get it. I was my next, my last question on this was going to be about the 1980 Olympics that got, that got post, uh, that the United yeah, well, States. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll move away from that then. I'll move away from that then, and okay. we can come back to no, it. No, no, no. I just go for it because uh, it's it, it. My understanding is that Bill Byrne, the, found, uh, the essentially the founder of this league, right, was was banking yeah. on the fact that the eighty Olympics would, like seventy six, yeah. take it to the next level. It's basically free absolutely for the game, right? Absolutely. And that goes away. Yep. That's a real shot. Uh, you know. A, a, yes. A, that's a real. Problem. That was a nail in the coffin. The, the beginning of the end. And I think we can see how much every Olympics played in the growth and acceptance, exposure and eventual acceptance of women. I mean, what that 96 team did, it jump started the WNBA. But before that, Ray Pun in 1995 got Cheryl Swoop signed the first signature shoe. And now all those Nike commercials that she was in on. So you look at how that started. Adrian's point is right on the money. There, there was, 
this hasn't been around forever. I think you look at the women now in the ads and, you know, just looking at Stewie's commercial the other day with Coke and you're looking at the opportunities that women are getting, but we're not talking about a long, long time. Adrian, did you want to continue to expand on your point? Adrian? Uh, I, I can just speak to when, um, you know, when I was legalist looking for opportunities, I was going to um, the sports conventions across the country. I was going to the, um, the final four exhibit booths representing different sporting good uh, companies and remembering how frustrating it was that none of them would, uh, would do women's athletics that we had. And I, I remember seeing a guy that was pointed out to me that was a, a, a head guy over at Converse. And I went up to him and said, why do we have to wear the men's shoes? Why don't you have women's shoes? There's a whole market in the growth of women's basketball. You know, why don't you come up with a woman's shoe? I mean, and I'm, I'm like harassing this guy as he's walking through his, you know, his area there. But it was, it was so frustrating because in those days we did wear the men's shoes in the WBL. Um, they, I think Avia and Nike were one of the first companies to come out with women products, uh, you know, for women athletes. I mean, if you weren't a golfer or a tennis player, uh, you wore the men's equipment. It's unbelievable. Adrian, did you finish making your point? Yeah, I was, you know, he just brought up oh. the fact that there, if there, you know, were the commercials that Faye and Kay Young did and, oh yeah, you know, so I was just speaking and, to that. And, and that was, that was huge. I will say this, there were lots of ads, you know, maybe not the commercials, but in print media, there were ads. Yeah, I've, we had seen, print. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of ads where you're the women, they got the women athletes, the WBLers advertising where there's glasses or selling furniture or doing. So there, there were a lot of things like that. I mean, if you look at it, there was, there was a, a lot of expertise in that league. It wasn't a lot of yeah, we had some that didn't know what they were doing and maybe we're just in it to see where it would take them. But I can certainly speak to Chicago's level of expertise and experience. And so they knew how to market it. Yeah. All right, I want to just quickly uh, now shift gears into uh, the denouement of the league and, and frankly, the the aftermath. And then then we can sort of maybe wrap up with sort of the path since and, and where we are uh, uh, for all of you and the game itself today. Um, how did you all sort of find out about there was no more league anymore. Uh, was it abrupt? Was it, uh, did you, was it foreboding? Did you kind of know it was coming? How did you discover this? And and what were your immediate thoughts about what next? Uh, I, I can sort of speak to that because, um, you know, I was there till the very end and um, they didn't, there was no official announcement of the WBL. Um, they had planned to have a draft after the third season. And um, there was some change in the uh, commissioner uh, when Bill Byrne left, um, uh, uh, Sherwin Fisher, from uh, who was a Chicago owner, uh, became the commissioner, and then I guess Sherwin stepped down, and you know, so they were looking for new leadership. Um, Dave were, Olmstead stepped in for Dave a minute. Dave Olmstead stepped in. Uh, he was the uh, uh, the general manager for the Dallas team where Nancy Lieberman played. So there was there was some reorganization going on, and they were trying to set up some meetings, and um, you know, it just it just that's what was so sad about it is there was no closure for us. Um, we all expected to come back to our teams and play. And then all we steps started hearing news that there was no draft. Um, there was no schedule set up and we're all like, Hey, what the heck is going on here? You know, the, the season's going to be starting in a couple of months, you know, so we were all just ready to play again and just nothing. And I can't even explain what that felt like. It was like somebody ripped my heart out. So you were finding out secondhand, largely? Yeah, there was no official announcement or, or direct contact with any of the players. We just were out there and gone. And that's why the reunion was so cool when we got together in 2003, because there was no closure for us. There was no official. I mean, they initially, they, they didn't actually announce that the WBL um, was done until like, I think January or February, where they officially closed the league in February of 1982. And so when the 1981 season didn't start, of course, everybody was writing about it and talking about it and we all figured it out. But, um, and we were in contact with different people with our teams who weren't given, who didn't have any news to give us or know what was going on. Mostly people just didn't know. They weren't sure what was happening or, 
what was going on. And then they talked like, okay, well, we're just going to take a year off to reorganize, get new leadership, get new ownership, and then we'll be back. So that's what I, that's we're the part in limbo and limbo just, you know. That's the part that I heard uh, that it was gonna, they were gonna take a year off. They're trying to regroup and reorganize. And then all of a sudden it was no more. So that was when I was like, okay, I'm done. I, I'm done with this, uh, this what if, or if it will happen. So that's when I, like I said, I went and I went to graduate school and then I ended up getting the opportunity to go to, um, go to Italy to play. But I was, I, there was no formal announcement me and it was very disheartening because you would think that they would have been uh would have had enough um respect or commitment to the players to give us some information which didn't happen so i think yeah. they were trying to the end i think they were trying to the end to to make it happen i don't think you yeah, nobody uh, wanted to give up yeah <laughs> and uh, can you imagine wnba players having played for three years and then having uh, the league. I mean, if you ask Coop and Swoops and um, the great players of the time, Lobo and Weatherspoon and Jennifer Gillum, all those that, you know, came and burst on the scene in the WNBA, Tina, if you, and then after three years, it was gone. I mean, just, I, I would love, be curious to, to know what they would feel like. And then people just forgot about you. Like nobody knew about the WNBA and now all of a sudden there's a new league that just started. How would you feel? And, and, and this leads to another point that those women that I just mentioned, we talked to a young audience in Knoxville that I mentioned at the ladies ball to cup to almost three weeks ago. I guess this is three weeks ago. Now um, they did not, the Cheryl swoops was the only one they remembered. And I think that's because her poster was up there and on the tour, they talked about her, her and Lisa Leslie another one that started the league. So they are basically the new forgotten. And here's the problem. I know we're going to get, you told me you would get to this in the end and what our mission is, but if I can just jump, jump to this while I'm on it. Yeah, please. If we don't go back and correct history, we don't often pattern ourselves after the men. Well, the men did it this way. We need to do it that way, but the men get it right in this instance. You go to the All-Star Games, Bill but Russell sits on his throne, rightfully so, and Dr. J and Michael, and they're revered, and they have games. They're included in the new games, and the young people know who they are, and they see them, and uh, they, they let them participate in the activities. You know, and I'm going back as far as I can. Big Oscar Robertson, I think those are the ones that are still alive from that era. And the W, I mean, the NBA is 75 years old. We're 43 going on 44 years old, but yet we're not included. So the men get that right. So if I would say now you don't know who Cheryl Swoops, Cynthia Cooper, Lisa Leslie, uh, eventually they won't know Tarasi or Sue Bird because unless we correct this, put everybody in their proper significance of every era, put them on the timeline and most importantly, include them. We're not, we're still here. It's not like we're, we've all died off, like our generation is gone. And sadly, though, we just lost two greats. We lost Lucy Harris. We lost Althea Gwynn first and Lucy Harris, not to mention others, uh, lesser known WBLers. We have got, the, time is not on our side and time is undefeated and it will keep wearing against us until we get this corrected. And I think once that happens, Lob can go to rest or continue or go away if we can get this correct it where we are inserted on the timeline in every area we call it the triad title nine aiaw wbl you can add the olympics in there you can add all the contributions after uh then you, you'll get it right so that that's a big part of why we are doing what we're doing and nobody, no, nothing, nothing would be more painful. And that Maya Angelou quote says, "Nothing is brings about more agony than is, than bearing an untold story inside you." And and that's what drives us and pushes us. It's it's not that hard. We are here, and we have a story to tell, and it's factual, and it's inspiring, and it's uh, and it's relevant, and it's important. And I don't know why it's so hard to go back and connect the dots. It's just not that hard. When when the league when the league collapsed in uh, in uh, at the end of eighty one and um, 
I know that um, uh, Bill Byrne uh, tried to bring back uh, the WABA, uh, women's uh, off the, I guess, off the 1984 Summer Olympics, as was alluded to earlier. Um, but I'm just curious your respective thoughts. Did you just think that the pro game had basically come and gone and, and the missed opportunity? Or, or were you convinced that at some point that, the pro game for women would come back again somehow. And, and at what point do you, um, I mean, it's a long time between that and the rumblings of the ABL and the WNBA, both sort of resurrecting that in, in the mid nineties. Um, how do you, uh, I want to say oh. persevere is the right word, but how do you, how do you maintain that faith? So to speak, if you believed it could come back again, it never, it never faded. We believed from when we stepped on the court the first year with the WBL um, that we believed in the future of women's pro basketball. That what it was, that's what it was all about. That's what we were fighting for. That's what the struggle was about. We knew it. We were young then, and but we knew it was significant, and we knew we were paving the way for the future. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, but um, that's what we've said over and over, and that we believed that there needs to be a women's pro basketball league and we believe in the future of it. It's going to happen. We all knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know when, but you know what, what Liz is uh, talking about here, as far as knowing your history is so important because we're all in this together in women's basketball. And I don't care what level you're at, whether it's high school, division one college, WNBA, um, we're all in this together and we need to recognize our history and, and honor those that came and paved the way for those before. And I think a lot of WNBA players have been amazing, uh, just supportive. Uh, you know, we, we had Tamika Catchings uh, get inducted in the Hall of Fame last year and, and recognized us in, in her speech. Um, and she's not the only one, Liz. I mean, there's been other WNBA players that have just been amazingly supportive, as well as the, as the NBA players uh, that are all for women's basketball development and women's pro basketball they always have been um you know wilt chamberlain had some great quotes supporting women's basketball uh dr j was quoted in a couple of magazines uh, saying how we're we're not diving we're shooting if we're not shooting we're passing you know if we're not passing we're stealing the ball i mean um so it, it's there it's just that people are being robbed especially the young people of of not knowing the history and, and like Liz likes to say, we're kind of a combination of the league of their own and, and hidden figures because we did get lost to, to that history. And just so Tim, you know, Tim, 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 Shaquille O'Neal and Shaquille O'Neal, I'm sorry, Char, but I just want to get this in. Shaquille O'Neal and uh, Steph Curry were behind this documentary, which we got to watch Sunday. Uh, hopefully Lucy's uh, documentary, Queen of the Basketball, will win. But they they kind of went back and discovered her and she was she was our queen but there were many queens during that era so if there was lucy wouldn't it stand to reason there were others you wouldn't say there was only tarasi or there was only coop or there was a there's many queens go ahead with your point Shar. Uh, my point was back to your question about uh whether or not we thought another league would come into existence you know uh, i went into high school coaching and we know that players went from the United States uh, all over Europe to play post um, college uh, because there was no league here. And because so many players were venturing out to continue to play out overseas, I kind of felt like eventually that was gonna, gonna get catch on here and that uh, they would try to bring another league back. I felt that within my heart. And so when the ABL, came about, uh, Liz and I were actually coaching, I was coaching with Liz uh, in, in Northern Illinois University, and we uh, made the track. We were so excited and happy to know that there was going to be a draft and they were start, going to start up that league, that we made the drive from Illinois. I won't even tell you the reason why, but there was a reason why we ended up driving in our life. So we made the drive from uh, Illinois to, to Atlanta. So it's out of excitement to be a part of that uh, whole thing coming about with the ABL. 
and we were everybody was just buzzing that you talked to just buzzing over the fact that there was, this was going to be coming back to this country so i kind of felt like it would come back because of what i just mentioned i won't restate it so um you know i was we were all eager that the abl did come into existence unfortunately it too did not last I almost had it. I had a chance to coach in the ABL and Trish Roberts did coach in the ABL. So uh, one thing, it, the, another point to make, we're const- we're connected to uh, almost every league that followed us in some way we're connected. And Peggy Gillum coached in the WNBA and Rita Swindell coached Teresa Weatherspoon who played in the WNBA. I, I think it, you'll find a fascinating as you connect the dots, you'll find it fascinating that our handprints are everywhere and, and you the those dots will lead back to one of us not to mention the coaching field the, the the coaching the wbca i know i'm rambling and getting off track but you'll find that i'm trying to get every point i can and uh, when we get a chance to speak on, on on our our relevance the wbca came into existence in 1981 when the wbl folded we flooded those ranks at every level and we're in in part were a big part of the growth of the WBCA, the Women's Basketball Coaching Association. And right now you see a lot of African-American women that I think there were 16 they mentioned coaching in the NCAA tournament. And we go and Marion Washington, who was Adrian's coach and Vivian Stringer, who we all adored and mentored us. Yet that's another, another example of us being omitted from history because we, we got those first division one head coaching jobs at predominantly white institutions. Our group did, but they never mention it. They go from Vivian and Marion and they jump to Dawn. They, they'll mention Carolyn Peck in there and they jump to Dawn and Adia Barnes and Neil Ivy, you know, the coaches and the coach at Buffalo. I can't think of her name, but I know her. And all these coaches who are coaching now and they go, wow, look how far we've come. And this group of women, we had coach Stringer and coach Washington. And now we have, all these young women. Well, in between there, you had us. Another, another contribution from our league, the women of our league, who took on, who broke uh, barriers, the African-American coaches who started coming in droves and, and got d- jobs at Division I schools. I just had to put that in there because we're watching NCAA basketball and watching the African-American uh, women, women in general, but also a lot of the African-American women who are doing so well. and. Um, once again, we're, we're not included. We're not talked about. And we did it before they did it. Yeah, look, I think this tournament actually is really uh, breaking out uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, standing uh, on its own uh, and then some uh, in the face of yes. what has long been dominated as, as the men's league. So a couple of other quick questions, though, guys, before I, I let you go, because this has been absolutely awesome. Um, and um, I, so I, I, in that drive from Illinois to to, to uh, from DeKalb to, to uh, Atlanta uh, and the excitement of the ABL. Did, did any of you and and others on this call uh, worry about sort of the uh, the competitive thing of the NBA with their fledgling WNBA? Uh, in some respects, it's kind of you go from zero to two leagues. We've seen this historically over time. Um, <clears throat> too much enthusiasm anew uh, at the same time. At worst, competing uh, uh, groups uh, it doesn't always necessarily mean the best of times ahead. Um, what did you think about sort of this? I mean, I, it, was it like, wow, this is great. All of a sudden we've got two entities wanting to do pro basketball again. Uh, but did, did, did you kind of worry maybe that maybe this is going to get screwed up in the process? I definitely did. And a lot of people did. We were happy with the ABL. Uh, and then the once the NBA got behind the WNBA, the people that I talked to and myself, my own personal involvement, it, it signaled the end of the ABL because they were competing for the same stars. So, and I've actually talked to Cheryl Swoops about it and different people about it who played. So, and Don Staley played in both leagues. A lot of them jumped from the ABL to the WNBA. Why? Money. Mm-hmm. If the NBA is backing it, then that's going to be your, your best bet. Valerie Steele, another one who was a great ABL star. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if she played in the WNBA, but she was a great star in the ABL. Katie Smith, there were so many of them that played in the ABL. And when the WNBA came, they they made the jump. But there were also others who wanted to maintain loyalty to the ABL. And I'm speaking from experience 
in talking and dealing with those people at the, those women at the time. So it, it was a good thing, but it also kind of worked against itself in a way. But I, I think it was a no brainer that with the NBA behind you, you were more likely to succeed and, and they're 25 years strong. Right. No, no question about it. But one thing, Tim, that I'd like to bring up is just that the explosion of growth for cable sports television was going on during this time lane too. And they were looking for programming and they wanted more women's sports for their cable sports programming networks. And there was all kinds of opportunities out there, which of course, the one thing that a league knows they need is television to survive. So that, you know, inspired a lot of people all trying to start leagues as well. When you had, you know, ESPN coming on, uh, you know, I think that was in the second or third year of the WBL that ESPN started. And, um, and then just, you know, the, the opportunities to be on television uh, with these the 20, some of them were 24 hour uh, cable sports programming. So they, they were dying for some, some good, um, you know, teams to, call, to cover and follow. So that, that's what inspired a lot of these people to try to start leagues then as well. Yeah, there's another case, right, where if only, right, a few years longer and the mm -hmm. pro pro proliferation, pro I can't even say the word, uh, <laughs> the, the dominance and the uh, uh, and the growth of cable television, right, and, and sports and all that stuff, right? I mean, a few more years and, and another Olympics under your belt, you know, the WBL may indeed uh, have been a more long-lasting, sustaining uh, entity. It was so close. It was so close. And the, and the yes. NBA was watching us just to see if, if we were going to. So, go. yeah. So let me use that as a, as a segue into sort of our, our, our final thoughts here. Um, I, so y you all mentioned the, um, and we didn't dig too deeply into it, but uh, there were these, I don't know if they were dalliances or on a local level, right? It does seem like there was some uh, branching out or, or, or outreach uh, in WBL uh, team uh, environments to at least maybe do a double header uh, with the NBA team or some cross pollination. Uh, you mentioned Larry O'Brien, then the, uh, the the commissioner of the league, at least attending the draft and stuff. So there was clearly some sniffing around and, and, and intrigue or, or interest in somehow figuring out, if not formally, some kind of collaborative uh, 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 help there. Um, I, so I, I can hear the trepidation and in, in, in the, uh, uh, the cynicism a little bit about sort of the NBA getting involved finally in the, in the, in the, in the 90s. Um, I guess the question in there is um, what of the NBA, the, the NBA's role in the WNBA today, um, its evolution, and is that preventative perhaps of embracing this history that we'll spent the last 90 minutes or so talking about, or is it just something that's inevitable? Because the one thing the NBA is really good at, right? I'll say it. You don't have to is, um, and I've seen this with other pro leagues too. The ones that have long, long lasting is there's a convenient whitewashing, if you will, of, of history. And, and to your point earlier, right. It, there, there's almost a, um, I don't know, almost a business goal or objective to keep the narrative that there was no women's basketball at a pro level until the WNBA kind of alive, right? So I guess the question in there somehow is, how warm, if at all, is the embrace of the WNBA to the history that preceded it? Um, and, and where does it fit and how can it fit when you've got a, a very, very successful NBA running the show? Um, does that get in the way or can they be essentially can they be brought to bear, so to speak, to, to remember and bring in this history and, and frankly strengthen the game overall for it? That I'm sorry, y'all, but I, I have to, I'm just chomping at the bit. That is, that is I'm one. I'm shocked that you would be the first person that, to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that no. is one organization. Well, I should say two, if you want to look at them as one entity be, under the guise of the, of the NBA, the WNBA, I mean, uh, but that is one entity right now we are working to collaborate with. We have tried with individual teams. We're about to reach out to Kathy Engelbert. We're, uh, Molly just spoke on a Women X, uh, who's another collaborative partner of ours. Um, and there was a, a, a member of the, of the NBA uh, listening 
So we're, we're going to be reaching out to them. They've always been on our target list. We have a lot of groups on our target list because they can help us. The NCAA is another, the Women's Sports Foundation. So why is it not embraced? Is it just that they don't know? And so we're going to go with that. They haven't been made totally aware of it. So with these individual teams that we're reaching out to in hopes that they will bring our story um, to Kathy Engelbert, we've also reached out to the Retired Players Association. We were the counterparts. I mean, our male counterparts during our era were in between uh, the Jordan Bird era, Magic era, not as old as Dr. J, Kareem and them were somewhere in between there, but we were the female counterparts. So we're looking, we have knee replacements and health issues and things that are going that we sacrifice for. They pull the WNBA in. So we're looking to get, to become a part of that, not just to get something, uh, you know, I shouldn't make it seem like we just want you to give us something, but we're your female counterparts of that era. So why isn't it happening? For a couple of reasons in my mind. We haven't made our case strong enough yet. We need to get to the powers that be, to the right entities. We need to make our case. And our case shouldn't be that hard to embrace. I mean, just if you're thinking off the top of your head. Okay. Secondly, we've got to uh, another plan in motion to go to the individual teams that we've made contacts with. Because when we've spoken to individual players on those individual teams, they, like, like we said, they didn't know. And once they know, they, are, they, are, they say thank you. They embrace us. We're working with the retired women's, I mean, the NBA Retired Players Association president and founder, Rusha Brown. We're trying to get with Terry Carmichael, who is executive officer, officer of the Players Association. So it's in the works. It's in the works to go there. We're trying to get with Wilson, who debuted the smaller ball in the W. BL and now it's come full circle that smaller ball has come back to the WNBA it never was with them it was always Spalding so there's a lot of things in place that we're trying to do we hope we'll be met with open arms we hope we will be embraced we hope that history they celebrate their history all the time the NBA does they're doing a, a their 75th year and every time you uh, click on your phone or look, there's a celebration of an individual or a group. So why wouldn't you want to know the full history? Why wouldn't it enhance the WNBA history as well as the NBA history? So um, I'm hoping somebody hears. I'm hoping somebody embraces. I hope there's no territorial feelings because we're not trying to take anything from you. We're just trying to connect the dots and help you know where you got how you got here. When I watched the movie Hidden Figures, I felt cheated when I found out about those women. I felt it was not fair that I didn't know. I, maybe I would have been a scientist. Maybe I would have been one of those women that helped men get, uh, helped us get into space. When you leave people of relevance in the dark, it cheats every generation that follows and the opportunity to learn from them. If you played in the 80s or beyond, there's a good chance you played for a WBL coach, a WBL player who went on to coach. So you've, we, we're everywhere. We're all in there anyway. You've, you've crossed paths with us already. You just don't know it. So I, uh, anybody else can add to that. But I just, it's in the works. We're trying. That's something we definitely want to do. We hope it will be met in the manner that in the intentions that it's, it's put out honorable intentions just to be included, just to help all of this growth make sense. And why, what better time than in the year 50th anniversary of Title IX? Without no Title, without Title IX, there is no WBL, there is no WNBA, there is no NCAA. So what better time than to bring attention to all that the WBL did before, during, and after? Well said. <laughs> Well, look, I, you know, I, um, so how can, I, how can someone come back with yeah, half of the, I'm just saying, how can someone else follow it? There's nothing else to be said. Well, come on now. But, but I, I would, I would also say though, um, you know, I, and don't take this the wrong way because this is, this is just a, a and I don't want to boil it down to this, but it's it, beyond all of that for all the right reasons that you just mentioned, right? It's actually, if you think about it, it's also, probably really good for business, right? I mean, the, the, to, to sort of reach back into the history 
and and not only celebrate it, but you know, I hate to sort of say this, but merchandise and and the old jerseys and the you know, oh yeah, the oh my God. Thing that we're there's so to many do. stories, I, right? Yes, yes, yes. yeah. The and they love it when they hear the stories. They love it. I mean, merchandising and cards. Okay, we're trying to talk to this women on top. So a couple of groups that that are doing the cards. Candace Parker wears throwback jerseys all the time. I think the I think they would love to wear the throwback jerseys. Yeah. There's a guy, Claude Johnson, with the black fives, and I don't know if you heard of them. They yes, wore throwback. We're talking to him they, soon, hopefully. Oh, okay. Well, we're supposed to be talking to him soon too, hopefully. And uh, we've been in touch with him. But the the, the Big East wore their throwback shooting shirts. I think there's an interest and appreciation, not to mention our logos are the coolest logos you will ever see, you know, and then the uniforms. So we, we are trying to to merchandise and get into all those areas. So that would be a great opportunity for them. Yeah, and this and for is us. the 50th year, you know, anniversary of Title IX. We're really trying to push and get ourselves out there and get our history out there. And we would love to, you know, it was too late, you know, or too, you know, the next season starts in what, May. If we could get introduced in our jerseys by these, you know, WNBA teams or like, say, the Chicago Sky had the, the WBL Chicago Hustle players come out on the floor or if they wore our jerseys in a warm up, you know, and there's several teams who can do that who had teams in their areas. And, you know, we're just looking for that recognition and how much, you know, people say, oh, wow, Chicago Hustle, I wonder who they were. Let me look them up, you know, and, and it would just merchandising, the history would be told, people would find out about us. And even the Wilson Ball, you know, that full circle Liz is talking about. Right. What a great commercial. <laughs> you right. Know? No doubt. You yeah. know, the other thing, just, just to add to that, Adrian, because uh, that's just such an excellent point is just in honor of the 50th anniversary of Title IX, we've LOB, um, our organization has participated in some significant documentaries that are coming out this year. And we were included in the historical narrative, which has been amazing. ESPN has a four part docuseries coming out. It's not all about basketball, but it's about Title IX um, that we participated in. It's due out June 1st. So, you know, we are getting our message out, um, you know, thanks to, you know, Legends of the Ball. And uh, people have been really receptive to it and really interested in our story. So, again, it's, it's sort of comparable back to WBL. Just give us a chance and hear us out. And you might be really surprised about, you know, what we have to say. And Tim, if there if there are uh, you know, uh, there some of your uh, guests listening in on this podcast, uh, you know, next week we're going to be headed out to the uh, to Minneapolis for the women's final four, but it's actually for the WBCA convention, and uh, so we're we're excited about what we're going to bring to promote our our. Um, um, mission agenda. while we're there, uh, to and we have so much stuff that that people. The first time that we our very first event that we had was at Tampa uh, for the uh, women's final for the WBCA convention then, and it was amazing. This year we're gonna gonna keep a, a, a tally of how many people actually come through our booth. That's one of the goals that I put for, for myself. But we had so many people visiting our booth and they were amazed at the stuff that they were able to learn from just coming through the convention center and seeing the things that we actually um, presented to them. They, they were informed, uh, they gained, gained knowledge and they were totally surprised that uh, many of them were for uh, what we were presenting. Well, I mean, look, God bless, because uh, uh, you talk about keepers of the flame, right? I mean, your four individual flames, you put it together, that it creates a, a healthy conflagration and and frankly, more of that, right? Um, and I'm sure there are plenty of more uh, opportunities yet to come. And you, frankly, you never know who listens to this show. Uh, there are, you know, I we've seen it in all these other sports and stuff. The stories just uh, that are, are uh, waiting to be surfaced, right? Uh, could they be? hidden figures, uh, motion picture uh, quality stuff. I'm not even talking about the documentary stuff, which is Absolutely. overdue and obvious, right? But there are the 
uh, you know, the, the the historical fiction, if you will, or the, the time and the era and the, you know, I'm sure there's some great little fun vignettes that we didn't even talk about that maybe shouldn't be shared or, or could be on the silver screen at some point or whatever the screen is. Real uh, stories are stranger than fiction. They could never make up. <laughs> <question. laughs> I'm sure you've got a few of them, um, for sure, all of you. Um, all right, well, uh, last question then, uh, Liz, and maybe you can be the, the fine point on this. Um, how can people follow you, uh, uh, the Legends of the Ball, get involved, uh, obviously website and all that other stuff, because uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure more than a few people will want to. Well, we, as I mentioned, after we made at the ladies ball, we, we, we really reached that target audience, that youth group, and they're on our Instagram, um, you know, uh, but the legends of the ball Inc. org, our website, legends of the ball Inc. on Facebook at legends underscore lob Inc. for Twitter legends uh, dash of dash of the well legends of the ball Inc. <laughs> Uh, hyphen in between all those letters on on uh, LinkedIn. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and our website. Okay, and coming TikTok coming soon. So follow us. We're celebrating the members of Legends of the Ball uh, during this Women in History Month, and which that will continue. So um, please support us. Uh, we we travel on. Um, different events you can find us and maybe we might even be in your own community so if you follow us you'll see what's coming up next for us and we also have a calendar of events that's going to be coming out so you'll get to see where we're going to be come out and, and see us and join us but most of all help us tell our story because it's really your story too none of us can get to the present without knowing what our history was All right, big time interestingness. Uh, thanks to our new pals, Liz, Charlene, Adrian, and our old pal, Molly. Um, good times had by all. I uh, enjoyed thoroughly that conversation. And boy, oh boy, so much more I'd like to do uh, delve into. Uh, we got to get Kara Porter here on this show. She, the uh, author of Mad Seasons, the story of the first women's professional basketball league. We'll have a link to that on our website at Good Seats, still available Com. Just search up this episode number 256 and you can order that easily and with a little referral love to us. We appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, you should follow uh, the doings of Legends of the Ball, much to uh, possibly be part of, especially if you have any ties to a professional basketball of any shape or size. Um, the URL is a little clunky, but here it is. It's legendsoftheballinc.org. All one word, Legends of the Ball, Inc., I-N-C, dot org. Uh, on Twitter, you can follow them, uh, Lob, as they're sort of collectively known, uh, at Legends underscore L-O-B-I-N-C. That's at Legends underscore L-O-B-I-N-C. Uh, and however you follow uh, the organization, uh, you can donate, you can uh, be part of their efforts. Uh, lots of history to uh, be um, uncovered, unearthed, reminded uh, to people, uh, et cetera. And uh, we look forward to not only staying in touch with um, uh, all the folks uh, as, uh, that are part of that, uh, but hopefully, uh, God forbid, actually, uh, you know, being uh, a part more uh, of doing some uh, some extra legwork, maybe helping uncovering a couple of stories, maybe some future conversations uh, with some of uh, the players that were uh, part of all of this mix. I mean, you know, I... Uh, there are just an amazing amount of names that I think any just general sports fan should be at least knowledgeable about or, or may remember, frankly. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the Faye and Kay Young uh, of the uh, the Dannon twins, if you will. We mentioned them before. Carol Blazjowski uh, was certainly a big name. Nancy Lieberman, um, who was certainly a, a, a part of that story. Ann Myers, uh, Mary Jo Pepler, um, you know, who we uh, referenced a couple of times uh, in our conversations around uh, the Superstars competition, as well as the International Volleyball Association. She was part of the New Jersey Jams in 78, 79. Um, and on and on and on. So many names and, and uh, just great stories. And and frankly, lots of um, uh, important history to uh, still yet be revealed. So thank you, ladies. That was uh, really enjoyable. And I, I learned a ton. And hopefully you in the audience did too. And um, we encourage you, of course, to uh, continue to follow us or subscribe to us. Do whatever it is that uh, you uh, 
uh, can ensure that you will not miss a future episode. Uh, and why not rate and review us while you're at those places? So we appreciate that. Wherever we're available, just about everywhere you can get podcasts. So there's really no excuse. And uh, let's see what else. Our website, as mentioned, goodseatsstillavailable.com. We post all of our episodes up there. Uh, you can download them. You can stream them. You can share them with your friends. Uh, do whatever. You can buy the books and the various materials um, that we reference here uh, on the show. We'll actually, by the way, we'll put a link up to, uh, we forgot to mention at the top of the show, uh, the Queen of Basketball is a relevant part of that. It's the uh, new, not new, actually. It's the... Um, how can I guess called the short form documentary? Correct. There you go. Uh, that was uh, uh, executive produced by uh, people like Shaq, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Stephen Curry, um, and just won, uh, by the way, the Academy Award for short form documentary. Uh, I think it was produced by the New York Times. You can find it on the New York Times dot com website, but we'll put a link up to that, too. Um, we didn't really talk about um Lucia, or actually Lucy, I think she goes by Lucy as a nickname, Harris, um, who uh, not only was, um, uh, you know, a, a big time player in women's uh, Olympic uh, basketball and, and the um, and the collegiate level. Uh, she was uh, the uh, only woman, uh, excuse me, only woman and first and only woman to be drafted by the NBA, the New, the New Orleans um, Jazz of the time. Um, and she turned it down for reasons that the documentary will explain. She also did, did though, play in the WBL uh, for the Houston Angels for a season, that second season of the league. Um, so, uh, you know, so much stuff that is just uh, sort of all bubbling up. Uh, and just uh, we'll have links to it again on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Our uh, social media feeds. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, you'll find a... Um, uh, a little uh, posting uh, uh, of sorts, usually on a daily basis, at uh, Instagram, at Good Seats Still Available. That's where you'll find us there. Uh, on Twitter, of course, you'll find us at Good Seats Still. Um, and what else? Email. Uh, please send some. We love to hear from you. We're at hello at Good Seats Still Available dot com. And uh, we yes, we have also have an email uh, newsletter that we send out each and every week, usually on the weekends, to kind of give you a tip sheet as to what's going to be on the uh, show this coming uh, each coming week. Uh, just uh, rattle around on the website and you'll find the link and just give us your name and your email address and boom, you're on the list. Thanks, of course, as always, to our pal Jerry, Dr. Jerry Payne uh, and uh, Jerry Payne Audio Excellence. Thank you uh, for knob twiddling again, sir, this week. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you next week with more fun-filled adventures in the world of forgotten sports. Uh, we hope. And uh, God bless. Stay safe, everybody. And we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.